So as long as I like, talk down to my chest, I'm good. Still make it out. We got like two minutes. I have to poop. I felt so heinous this morning, dude. I went for a five mile run and pooped twice. I don't do well with unlimited alcohol and like food. People are still coming in. Why? Why are they doing this? I don't know. This is. Can you imagine if like every seat was full, like DEF CON? Like just like thousands of people? There's a fuckload of people in here, dude. Have you here for me? Just do like run up and down so that they distract you when I was sitting there. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. I can crab walk, bear crawl, all kinds of weird shit. Do it. I see they changed the, the, the zeros to Oscars, to O's for noobs. That's less sleep, dude. Oh. I don't know. I don't think I did that. I got bad news. I have to do this? Yeah, we're at time. <laughs> we're gonna get started. All right, all right. Good afternoon, friends, colleagues, confreres. Thanks for coming. You didn't have to. You literally could have done anything else. Uh, there are a lot of people here, uh, and that's awesome. This is my first time speaking ever. I've never spoke before. Um, I think I'd be more nervous, but at least a dozen people are here just to heckle. So that makes me <laughs> feel better in my heart. Um, I'm a consultant. I work for VDA Labs. Uh, I do some things with technology and computers, uh, pen testing, blue team engineering, some stuff with malware, uh, having lots of fun. I'm also, Greg, I'm your personal trainer, right? Yes, James is my personal trainer. <clears throat> so I also work at VDA. We do red teaming, pen testing, secure code auditing, kind of the whole umbrella of cyber operations. So as you can see here from our title, um, reverse engineering malware for noobs. So the, t the title in the talk today is not like going to be very in-depth, but it's just going to give you a base starting point so you can look at malware and see what's going on. So why do this? It opens up career opportunities. You can do IR. You can do malware analysts. You can get a malware analyst position. You do all kinds of cool stuff, uh, penetration testing. Yeah, so you, you can't prevent everything. Um, it's certainly, we try, but it's never going to happen. And when a latent threat is discovered in your network, for instance, you need to know what it's been doing there for the last year or last five years. What were its capabilities? So also why do this adversarial thinking? You're going to want to know uh, why the adversary was doing what he was doing with his malware, uh, what registry, registry keys did he modify, um, where are the strings, can you grep for those strings throughout your entire environment? You know, is like, is that only one, that one box is infected, or was it multiple boxes that got infected? Yeah, so I think um, another reason to do this kind of thing is just because you want to, right? Knowledge is fun, learning stuff is cool, figuring out how stuff works is awesome, being curious enough to do the thing is bananas. I think that's why some of you are here. And then uh, the bottom of the slide is these are the types of people, the types of roles and positions that companies hire that do this kind of thing. 
Oh, so, so malware and malware analysis in general is a very broad and nebulous field, right? We simply don't have the time to cover all of it in depth or even get very granular in just an hour. We're going to cover the basics uh, just to get you started. Yes, yeah, so we're going to discuss the malware analysis process. We're going to talk about static analysis. We're going to talk about automated analysis, dynamic, all those cool topics. Um, setting up a safe lab environment, James will be covering that. Things like setting up a safe sandbox, um, not sharing your folders in your VM that's going to be infected with your main host so you don't ransomware yourself. Some of the slides in this deck are a little bit busy. Um, there's a lot of text on them and whatnot. Don't worry about trying to take photos or anything. Um, anybody that wants this deck will make it publicly available. Just ask. Or did you want, did you have more to say about? That? Um, yeah. So limitations of this talk, you know, it's kind of be like skin depth. We're only be covering Windows malware. Um, some of you may have gone to Dr. Jerry Demott's uh, talk about ten minutes ago, but he talks about alpha applications. That's going to be Linux. We're not going to be talking about Linux at all today. It's all going to be Windows because Windows has a significant market share. Yeah, um, Android too. We will not be talking about. And Android has, I think, the most operating systems on the planet right now. Um, this talk is meant to be for anybody and everybody. If someone comes in here without a technical background, if you're in high school or college, um, this is for you. If you're doing incident response for your career, um, try not to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think it'd be silly to have a presentation about malware without first discussing what malware actually is, right? And it's sort of this broad term that implies weaponizing technology to subvert intent. I intend to download an MP3 to listen to Rick Astley's hit single, Never Gonna Give You Up. I don't intend to give control of my computer to some guy over the internet. But because malicious files exist, this kind of thing can happen. So we need to know about it, talk about it, learn about it. Generally, the common stuff we see day in and day out, the widespread SWAT Assange commodity malware, is trying to make someone money. People like money whether it's by encrypting your hard drive and demanding tribute, or using your CPU to mine cryptocurrency, serving you ads, scaring you into buying a fake product, or stealing your identity. Sometimes there are other motives. My favorite example in, in the oops category is the Morris worm, or the, or the great internet worm of November 2nd, 1988, when Bobby Morris created a worm, one of the first worms, to um, expose vulnerabilities in Unix systems. It worked too well and would reinfect the same system multiple times until it overloaded the CPU and killed it. Um, this prompted DARPA to create the first CERT or com Computer Emergency Response Team, a team that is alive and well in the private sector today and who hires people that do the kinds of things we're going to talk about today. It also resulted in the first felony conviction of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, so don't do this stuff at home. Don't break stuff. Um, there's also this idea of non-malware attacks, right? We just use pre-existing legitimate programs, ports, and protocols to do something nefarious. It's actually probably about 50 to 60% of all the malicious activity we commonly see in, in 2019. Um, unfortunately, that's outside of the scope of this talk, so we're not going to talk about that today. So how do, how do people get malware? Um, you know, and I don't mean how do you get it if you're a researcher. How do you get it when you're not trying to, right? How's it spreading? Legitimate programs often uh, offered for free that have malware hidden inside, an idea as old as time, email attachments, technical vulnerabilities, USB thumb drives, hanging out with Thomas Somerville. There are many mediums for the modern malicious malady. All right, so we know what it is. We know that it's bad. Greg, what do we do about it? Well, hopefully we do something about it, right? So we're going to talk about triangles today. That was a bad joke, I'm sorry. No, we're gonna talk about malware. So this is a triangle representing the malware analysis process. As we go up the triangle to the peak, um, the analysis process gets harder and harder. So starting at the bottom, the base of the pyramid, we have fully automated analysis. This is, you have your malicious EXE or or whatever file you're dropping in the uh, automated malware analysis. But you can drop it in a virus total or a hybrid analysis or use any runs. Anyways, you're going to drop it in there and it'll just spit out what the malicious strings are and all kinds of badness like the registry mods it does. 
and et cetera. So one step up from that is static properties analysis. So what static properties analysis is, you're using a tool like PStudio, you can drop your malware in that, now you can look at the strings one by one, you can look at the sections, the resources it's using, maybe you can look at what language the malware is written in. Um, those things can all be spoofed though, however, especially the, the language, that's not really a, a good identifier to go off of. Uh, one step up from that is interactive behavior analysis. This is where you're using something like Cuckoo, which is somewhat automated, and you're looking at, um, this is more of a dynamic analysis, you're looking at how the malware is modifying the registry, how is it modifying the file system, is it setting up scheduled tasks or cron jobs. And then the hardest part of reversing malware is actual reversing. This is where you're getting into Ghidra, uh, maybe using WinDebug. You could be using uh, IDA Pro, for example. And this is where you're actually breaking down, you're looking into the assembly of how the malware is written. Okay, so start, starting at the bottom of the pyramid, the easiest portion, um, automated malware analysis. This is great for code coverage. You can drop it into virus total or hybrid analysis, and it's gonna cover the whole EXE once and for all. It's very fast. If you wanna get a quick look, if you're the SOC analyst, a large enterprise, you really can't afford it just to be spending your time getting into the weeds with this stuff. You wanna get a quick first look at it. So, Automated mal mal malware analysis. On the left-hand side is we've dropped a malicious file in virus total. And we can see here that it's a 52 out of 69, I think, is the number. And that what that is looking at is virus total uses a lot of uh, antivirus and EDRs, uh, the signatures that are in those EDRs and AVs, to discern whether or not a file is malicious. So that is a pretty high ratio, and that's why it's red. So this is probably malware. So on the right-hand side, we have a good URL. We went to google.com, and notice how it's now zero um, out of whatever number's on the bottom. So that would be a very good sign that that is not malicious. Yeah, I'm gonna interject and, and apologize. We kind of assumed that the, the projector screen would be behind us and we'd actually be able to see it, but that's, that's on us. All right, so a really cool part of Virus Total is looking at the behavior uh, tab. So on the right-hand side, you see um, a bunch of registry modifications that it's doing. You see some registry keys that were also deleted. Um, one inter interesting register key, I'm actually just gonna walk over here so I can see what's going on. <laughs> so on the bottom here we see uh, Microsoft PC Health error reporting. Um, so the malware actually deleted the key that would tell Microsoft Windows the operating system that it was a malicious file. So that's probably a sign that this is uh, a malicious file. So on the left hand side we see the malware reaching out to mbukwaishin.biz. Um, I don't think that's a legitimate website. I'm not sure what you guys think, so. Yep, go ahead. Back to me. All right. When you do malware analysis, you will detonate real malware. It is dangerous, and if mishandled, potentially illegal. It is critical that you understand the risk that comes with this and how to avoid infecting machines or networks that you did not intend to. So we use isolated lab environments that you can infect and interact with. The computers can be physical, they can be in the cloud, but most often this is done using virtualization tools such as VMware or VirtualBox for convenience and control. And that's the type of environment I'm gonna talk about setting up. So FireEye's Flare is a great VM that has a lot of preloaded tools. Um, Lenny Zeltzer's Remnox is a similar product. It's a Linux VM. These are awesome tools to get you up and running quickly. In you know, five, 10 minutes you can be fully up and running with an analysis machine. However, it is easy to get lost in the sea of many tools. Um, I draw the corollary when I do pen testing. Kali Linux, for instance, is an awesome platform, but there are thousands of tools on it. Many of them you may not know how they work or even know that they exist. So sometimes so, um, reinventing the wheel is a good approach to help you learn um, what your tools do and to make sure that you actually know what's on the VM. If you don't believe me, here are the tools that are included on the Flare VM by default. I'm going to go through each one of these and talk about what they do. <laughs> uh, Dex to jar takes Dex files from an Android system and compiles them in a zip file in a jar form. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. All right. So let's reinvent the wheel. This is a wheel. That's a wheel. It um, illustrates that Windows is by far and away the most popular operating system on the planet. For obvious reasons, that's the operating system that the bad guys are targeting. Windows 10, followed closely by Windows 7, are the most popular. It is helpful to have 
multiple versions at various patch levels. And uh, having certain programs on them like Office, because many a lot of malware will target the Office suite is a good idea. Fortunately, Microsoft makes this easy. I cannot believe I said that out loud. Microsoft makes this easy. Not a sentence I ever thought I would say, sorry. <laughs> um, they offer VMs that you can go download to test Edge. These are fully licensed VMs. You download them for any platform that you have, enable the license, take a snapshot of that as soon as you enable the license, and then you can revert to that anytime and effectively have an indefinite, fully licensed Windows VM, Windows 7, Windows 10, and it's a good place to start. Okay, so you got a VM, where do you put it? In a hypervisor, they have their pros and cons. VirtualBox is free. I personally prefer VMware. Um, it just works better for my needs. VMware Player is free, but does not support snapshots. So that's a good thing to know. You, you Snapshots are very important in this line of work and during the analysis triage. Uh, yeah, so there, there is always risk involved, and we're going to talk about the ways we can configure these to avoid some of those pitfalls. For instance, some of the things that make your life easier make your life harder. Um, I enable shared folders, for instance, to drop my malware from my Mac system or Linux system into my Windows VM. That's awesome. That certainly makes things a lot easier, but there could be some risk there. Shared clipboard, another thing. Copy and pasting between environments is really helpful. But if you have a banking Trojan, it will look at your clipboard and it's going to see everything that you've copied from your host system. Just some things to keep in mind. Networking. Oh, excuse me. Malware uh, doesn't want to be analyzed. Okay? Plain and simple. The bad guys know what the good guys are up to. It's a cat and mouse game. Malware can avoid doing anything if it detects that it's in a VM or in an automated sandbox or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's dead simple. The malware will look for documents. Are there no documents? Are there no browsers? Is there nothing in the temp directory? Are there third-party programs installed? So how can we start to eliminate some of these obvious things? At the bottom is an example of some interesting one I ran into the other day. This malware is using WMI to query the CPU for its temperature, which is supported on physical systems, but not supported on virtual systems. Back to that cat and mouse game, you can create a service that listens for that API call and responds with a number. Networking. Bridge is bad. Don't do bridge networking. This is essentially putting another computer on your network, particularly if you're doing this in a corporate environment, this is a good way to have the FBI contact you. Um, NAT is okay sometimes. Sometimes you want uh, certain pieces of malware if you're already sort of familiar with what they're going to be doing to be able to communicate, communicate to the internet. Host only is generally where we're going to reside, where the malware can communicate to your host system and nowhere else. Fake net, Greg will talk about more later, but this is a great program that intercepts all internet traffic and logs it and responds with fake 200 OK requests. Lastly, some malware will look for that virtual machine uh, networking interface. So if you disable that, you may have to do that for certain malware triages. Some anti-analysis techniques employed by malware will look for analysis tools, as you might imagine. And it's why pre-built machines, as I mentioned, like Flare and Remnox, are not the best solution all the time, and it's a good idea to know how to build your own. So how do we make a box look legit? Ninite.com is a great place to grab a bunch of apps at once in one package, and in less than five minutes, you can make your system look a little more legitimate. The OA Box Builder is a plural site script that you can take and put on any box, and it will... Um, rename some of the analysis tools so that malware that's looking for those common names won't find it, as well as grab a lot of the tools like from that slide deck that, that was crazy earlier and put those on your system for you. In five, ten minutes, you'll have it all set up and ready to go. Also a great idea to have Office installed, as I mentioned. And if you get it from Pirate Bay, then you have a two-for-one because now you have malware to analyze, analyze and you have <laughs> Office. <laughs> Um, yeah, so general, in general, this is what my triage environment looks like, or one of my triage environments. VMware, I take the original licensed copy of the VM, snapshot it before I do any modifications to it, then I add my tools, make it look legit, make the configuration changes I want to, snapshot it, 
Then I explode malware on it and revert and do that over and over again. One new mistake that um, maybe I've made before is analyzing multiple pieces of malware without reverting back to a snapshot. Not generally a good idea. All right, I'll hand it back over to Greg. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the PE header. Uh, PE stands for the Portable Executable uh, File Format. So the PE header exists for two reasons. Um, all, in, all the info that the operating system needs to execute the program is going to be right there in the PE header. Uh, all your sections, your IET, your resources. It also directs the OS where the program goes into memory. Um, we won't go too deep into the file format, but we are going to cover some of the good stuff that it has. Okay, already did it. Good job. <laughs> so, how does malware hide? Um, one of the really simple things that they do is, is malware authors can pack their malware, which is similar to zipping or gun zipping it. Um, if you're using a packer like UPX, the compression rate is actually a lot uh, better than the traditional zipping tools like WinZip or GunZip or just .zip. Um, obfuscation techniques um, also, so packing is a subcategory of obfuscation. There are other things uh, like that James will talk about later, like XOR encoding and Base64 encoding. And uh, what are the attacker's goals when they are trying to obfuscate their malware? Um, they want to slow down the reverse engineer. They want to avoid uh, AV detection also. So if you guys think back to WannaCry, um, I think it was like May 2017, you know, that the crypto ransomware that took over the world essentially. Um, think about if that malware would have been obfuscated better and it wasn't be able, it was not able to be reversed as quickly as it was. So, um, in general, WannaCry, it had a very low level of obfuscation. So, just things to think about, uh, the impact that, um, that could have had. Slide. So, obfuscation, uh, the definition is just the act of making something obscure, unclear, or uh, unintelligible. Good and bad actors do this. You know, legitimate software vendors do not want you reversing their code because then, you know, you can make it yourself and put it out there. Obfuscation, obfuscation does not equal security. Um, those are not, those are not the same thing. Obfuscation is just a way to slow down a reverse engineer, essentially. It does increase the time, effort, and depth of knowledge um, because the person has to reverse it and they have to figure out what is your exact obfuscation method that you used. So think WannaCry, I already used that example. And it does hide what the program actually does. So packing, unpacking malware, uh, what is packing exactly? It's just compressing or obfuscating within another program. Um, and it... It is very hard to analyze the program until it is unpacked, so you're going to want to do that first. And it must be defeated so you can see what the actual program is doing. You can see like the actual valid sessions, or sections, excuse me, and resources. So why do evil people pack their malware? As I said before, um, it buy, buys the evildoer's time because now a reverse engineer has to go line by line through the assembly and figure out what's going on. So the packing process, on the left-hand side, we have an executable or a DLL. Um, it's perfectly fine. It's Maybe it's malicious or something, but it's unpacked, essentially. So looking at it like that, in P, a tool like PE Studio, we would see the strings, the imports, the sections, um, low entropy because it's not packed yet. It goes to the packer. All those things change. And we can no longer see the strings. We can't see the imports. Um, sections, we could see some sections, but it would probably show the actual name of the packer for sections now because the program, uh, you can't see the program anymore. And it would have a lot higher entropy after being packed. And that's something we'll go into later. Go Packers. Um, the most popular packer th that is used for uh, packing malware is going to be UPX far and away. There are some less common ones that you should know, like LZMA and FSG and NS Packer. Um, but if you're, if you're downloading anything off like VirusShare, it's probably going to be packed with UPX. Okay, let's cover some tools for looking at malware now. So on the left-hand side, we have xinfo.pe. Uh, it's great for packer detection, um, compiler detection, and it actually suggests which unpacker that you should use to unpack your malware. Um, so the example here, so image is 32-bit executable. Uh, it was packed with UPX, and to unpack, there's the exact command. So this is a very uh, efficacious tool if you want to know how to unpack your malware very quickly. And there's the link that you can get that. On the right-hand side, we have PE Studio, which is a, it's a much more granular tool. We can really break out uh, what is going on in the, in the program. So under sections, I'm not sure if you guys can see that. It's kind of small. But in sections, all it says is UPX. 
So that is far and away uh, a sign that UPX packing was used or utilized to pack this malware. So P Studio Packer Detection. On the left-hand side, we have an executable that has been packed. Um, and we've dropped that in P Studio. Um, the imports, there's only two strings, there's only four. So if you're ever looking at a program and there's only four strings, that's a sign that something weird is going on. Um, also for, for imports, you know, a, a program needs more than two APIs to do anything. So on the right-hand side, after unpacking, um, P Studio has actually reached the limit for looking at the strings because there's so many. Um, and also imports, now there's 23 APIs that we're looking at. So this is the only slide of IDA, I promise. I know this is a, a talk for more entry-level uh, malware analysis uh, analysts. So on the left-hand side, we have a piece of malware that has been packed, and we've dropped it in IDA Pro. And as you can see here, without knowing anything about assembly, um, the function all the way down is UPX. So obviously it's been packed with UPX, and on the, on the right-hand side, we've dropped the unpacked malware in IDA Pro, and you can actually see the functions now. So that's another telltale sign that this malware has in fact been packed. So we're gonna talk about the entropy packing relationship. Um, entropy is just a measure of the randomness of code. So something that has uh, very low entropy would like it be a string of all zeros or all A's. Maximum entropy would be something like the alphabet, A through Z. There is no repetitive characters. So it's based off Shannon's formula. Entropy is very easy to tell for packing or, or encryption actually also. So I like to think that anything greater than seven is probably a sign that packing or encryption is in play. So right here in this blue uh, histogram, this is when packing is in play. So the entropy is relatively, um, is relatively high. So that means every, every bit is, you know, um, yeah, that'd be like a string of like A, B, C, D all the way through Z. Whereas on the right hand side, this histogram, that's more, um, yeah, this is actually all of the letters in the English language and how often those letters show up in words. So this is a more accurate um, entropy of that. So as we see, E would show up like 12.49%, and then T shows up 9.28%. So in malware, we can use entropy to be like, okay, well, there's a high entropy. Why does every single thing look the exact same? Because it's been packed or encrypted, that's why. Okay, this is a great tool, a free open source tool. It's called Detected Easy or Die. Um, excellent functionality for detecting entropy in files. On the left hand side, we have our packed malware. Uh, just a first glance, the entropy by byte or bits and bytes is 5.56. So what did we just say? We have the scale that is zero through eight, where eight is a very high entropy. And seven is kind of the threshold. If it's above seven or equal to seven, it's probably been packed. So if you look at just that, you would think that maybe this malware is not packed. When in fact, if we go down to the sections here, um, it says UPX, the entropy of that section is 7.8. So it also we can see this bar graph is flat across here. And it's right at 7.8. That's also a telltale sign that packing is in play because that's a very high entropy. So on the, oh, one more. Uh, then on the right-hand side, we have unpacked, and we have a base entropy of 5.2. And if you look over the sections on the right-hand side, there is no uh, sections that are above seven. So that's a pretty good sign that this is not packed anymore. Okay, so when signatures fail. So your worst nightmare, your malware analyst, you drop a fresh malware sample in P Studio. All the signs of packing are there, you know, high entropy, lack of APIs, all the normal things that you would see in P Studio. But there's no packer signature left behind in either strings or sections. Now what? Like, how do you know it's really packed? How do you unpack it if it's packed? Do you just quit? So this is where Cuckoo Sandbox comes in. So this is a sandbox for dynamic malware analysis. This is free open source, which is really cool because if there's some functionality that you need for looking at your malware and it doesn't have it, you could add it, actually. So for looking at um, the process memory, we can run the malware in the dynamic sandbox, and then we can pull the binaries out of memory post-execution in Cuckoo. So for the malware to actually run, um, it has to be unpacked. So without actually unpacking it manually, um, it's kind of a way of cheating the system, right? So. That's it? Yep. All right. 
So you go to the Christmas tree, you grab your present, you shake it, <laughs> right? You look at it, you flip it upside down. Maybe you look at the tag, see who it's from. That's static analysis. It's superficial, but very beneficial. In a relatively short amount of time, it can provide you insight into program functionality and provide a guide for what to do when you do the dynamic analysis, when you actually explode or detonate the malware could also possibly allow you to generate signatures that can use to be to detect and prevent. Here's where you determine, for example, if a program is actually malicious. You don't want to spend an hour looking at a renamed copy of Notepad. Of course, the malware authors, or the present wrappers, to stick with the holiday analogy, they know we're doing this, and they'll do whatever they can to make it harder. There are many tools for static analysis, a few of which we'll talk about, you are quite literally battling the bad guys, and the tools are your weapons. So when one fails, you pick up another one, and you keep battling. Right off the bat, as simple as it gets, hashes are mathematical functions that give you, you, you give an input to, and they produce a static output. If you give it the same input every time, it produces the same output. They are critical to malware triage, and in general, to much of our digital world. Because they're really step number one, and so important to the overall process, you will find that many of your tools will include hashing as part of the tool's capabilities. There are several types of hashes, all of which are useful, and some tools like ComputeHash, um, example here, will give them all to you very simply. There are tons of tools online too, but be careful about uploading sensitive data to the internet. You don't want to upload the HR folder just to see what the hash is. It is a common best practice to rename the malware as its hash. Uh, this serves two purposes. It's now your unique identifier, and you've removed the extension so you don't accidentally double-click it, for instance, when you don't mean to. All right, so you think you've got malware. Maybe it's a Word document, but is it really? TRID, the graphical tool shown here, has over 12,000 file types in its database. It analyzes components of the file to give you its best guess, including identifying packers. It's a great tool that hasn't failed me very often. If it doesn't immediately give you the right answer, it's going to give you some good insight into what it probably is. File is a command line tool native to Linux and has a Windows binary as well. It provides a single, straightforward output. All right, so you've got a hash and you know what type of file we're dealing with, so let's dig in a little. A string is just some text, right? Programs are written in languages. Languages use text. They present themselves in two ways, either in ASCII or in Unicode. Some tools will only look for ASCII. Others will only look for Unicode. Some will do both, and you need to be aware of that because you are looking for both. There's also a minimum string length that these tools will look for. It's just important to know how your tools are set up and configured before you use them. In general, the longer string length you look for, the less garbage strings you'll see, but you could also miss some important things like git and put and, and certain uh, you know two or three word commands that could be important for your triage. All right, tools. Tools is the job. Strings is to strings as file is to file. It's a dead simple command line utility that searches through the file from beginning to end and prints out everything it finds that's three characters or longer. Running strings against a large binary can produce 10,000 or more results and produces tons of noise mixed in with important information. Bin text is the graphical equivalent. Both of these tools will look for ASCII and Unicode strings. Of course, they have no idea what a valid string is uh, com as compared to raw data. The utility will often print out a lot of meaningless strings. Again, it has no idea what the difference is. Here in PE view, we see the same sort of information. I can't use my, my, I do have a later pointer that I intended to use, but that's okay. So PE view here will give you the raw data, the hex, right? So a byte is going to give you your ASCII character. Every Windows executable, executable will have the string. This program cannot be run in DOS mode, for example, in the first couple of bytes. Um, obviously, this, this seems like, well, this is kind of hard, right? Are we going to really scroll through all this stuff manually, look at every string, if there's 10,000 of them, and try to figure out what this program is doing? The whole idea for strings analysis is to find different functions, maybe find some URLs, find out what the function, what this program is actually doing. 
So, uh, about a month and a half ago at DerbyCon, the FireEye team released a machine learning tool called String Sifter that's pretty interesting. It automatically sorts strings based on their relevance for malware analysis. Super helpful. This is a new hot tool, and if you're into this kind of thing, I highly recommend you check it out. Here's an example of left, you see an unpacked program. You can see some file names. You can see registry keys. You can see other things that are going on there that are going to give you an idea of what this program is trying to accomplish. On the right, you see the same exact program that's packed, and you're getting nothing from it. Malware authors often pack the program to hide the real strings, among other things, as Greg talked about. Unfortunately, they'll also pack the program and then add legitimate strings on top of that. So again, it comes back to that cat and mouse game. You can only trust your tools so far, and you shouldn't base any of your conclusions solely on strings analysis or even static analysis in general. What are some of the other ways that malware authors are trying to hide strings? Packing, obfuscation. Packed programs are a subset of the obfuscated ones. Um, even packed programs, though, will contain functions like get proc address and load library. Fortunately, either out of laziness or ignorance, the malware authors will often use one of two simple techniques, base64 encoding or a simple encryption scheme such as XOR. And I'll talk about what those look like. So base64 is just your English alphabet, upper and lower case, and a few special characters. Um, if you see this in your malware when you're doing strings analysis, if you see the base64 alphabet, it's a good sign that that malware is using base64 encryption somewhere or encoding somewhere in the program. Um, that string there is an example of what that looks like. If you ever see equals equals or equals, that's an automatic dead giveaway. Base64 is being used somewhere. Fortunately, they're easy to find and they're easy to decode. There are many tools that do the decoding and the searching. Um, if you're using a Windows VM, which is most likely if you're doing this type of analysis, you can do this natively. You don't need to download anything. You just need to enter a command into the command line, um, set up a command that will do this for you. Dead simple, super helpful. Next thing, XOR encryption. It's a mathematical bitwise operation that returns one if the, the bits are different and a zero if the bits are the same. All right. If you take some data A and XOR it with the key, you get ciphertext C. If you take the ciphertext and XOR it with the key, we get the original data. Um, you don't need to commit this to memory, but it's important that the principle of how this works because it can be undone. Fortunately, there are tools that help us do this. DigiStevens.com. Uh, he is a malware analyst that produces a lot of very highly effective tools that take some of the legwork out of this for us. Because of the principle of how the encryption works, if you know a bit of plain text, you can rather simply decrypt it. XOR strings is a string like a strings utility, but it uses some trickiness to look for what it thinks is XOR encrypted strings. XOR search will brute force all XOR keys and other common weak encryptions that are often used in malware as well. So you enter the text that you think is going to appear in that file. As I mentioned, this program only will only run in DOS mode, is in every Windows executable. That's a good one to search for. HTTP, as in URLs, is another great one to search for, as well as kernel and create, as those are the most common functions called. Moving on, the portable executable, executable header. It's like the to from tag on the present, right? It's going to give you some basic information about what this program does, what it contains. We'll talk about these sections. These are the most common sections that you'll see in the PE header. Sections contain characteristics, including permissions, such as read, write, and execute. If we see random missing or unknown section names, that's an indicator that we're dealing with packed malware. If we see odd permissions, say a section with write and execute, this can be placed into unpacked code or place unpacked code into memory after the malware is run. So let's talk about those imports and functions that I've been mentioning. Dynamic link library. As a program interacts with an operating system, it's not going to bring with it all of the code and all of the libraries that it needs to run. 
And that's a good thing. Otherwise, every program would be huge, they'd be really slow, and we'd have a miserable time using computers. Instead, they use functions inside of dynamic link libraries. A DLL is a library of code, and an API call, or a function, is an interface to that library of code. The import address table is just a list of dynamic link libraries and functions from that DLL that the program uses. APIs don't have to specify, specify by name in the import address table. They can use ordinals, which is a numeric offset to the function within the DLL. Sounds a little complicated, and that's why malware authors will often, instead of including the name, they'll only use ordinals. Fortunately, our tools can suss that out for us. Or you can Google it. PE Studio. It's kind of like the header analysis Swiss Army knife. Uh, Greg mentioned it earlier. You don't get everything, but you get a lot, including strings, indicators of compromise, virus engine alerts. Additionally, you see the import address table, how many functions are being imported for each DLL. And the import address table size is a great indicator of whether or not the malware is packed, as Greg talked about earlier. If you see very few functions and very few DLL imports, that malware is definitely packed. Here's some common APIs. There are thousands of APIs. Um, the link there will take you to MSDN network, which will give you the full and complete list of all uh, functions. Write file, for instance, means that malware will write to the file system. Create doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to create something new, but it can also be used to open existing files. Reg set value, reg set key, both write to the registry. This is where I would be pointing at stuff, but I'm, I'm too far away. Any function with an EX on the end, um, as there's one in this example, that's an extended function, so they just, um, Microsoft has released a newer version of that. If you see any of these network things, that's an indicator that your, your malware is communicating over the network. Listen, for instance, opens up a port, often indicative of a backdoor. Many functions do the same thing, or nearly the same thing. Beware of fake imports. Similar to the strings, where they'll pack the malware and then add in legitimate looking strings after the fact, many malware authors will include loads of DLLs, imports, and functions that do nothing other than confuse you, confound you, and make you take a lot of time chasing down rabbit holes. Again, this is why we do static analysis, because we want to use the least amount of the analyst's time as possible to figure out whether a file is malicious and or what are its capabilities. Some more examples here, load library and git proc address. They allow new dynamic link libraries and functions to be added while a program is running and not specified in the import address table. That gives you an indication that you need to look for new stuff when you do your dynamic analysis. Is debugger present? Checking for a debugger is a good indicator that this malware is trying to employ anti-analysis techniques. Write process memory injects into an already running process. There is a noted caveat here. .NET programs have their own version of the import address table. So mscory.dll and underscore core xe main are the only two things you'll, say, you'll see. I simply mention that because .NET malware is pretty prolific. So that's it, right? To wrap up, we're looking for strings right off the bat to see what this malware is doing, what are its capabilities. These are simple kind of things, whether we know it's packed or not. If it is packed and we can identify what packer packed it, we unpack it and then we do our static analysis. And I'll hand it back to Greg to talk further about dynamic analysis. So dynamic analysis fundamentals, we're now in execution mode. We're no longer jiggling the Christmas present as James uh, liked to use that analogy. This is the real deal, no more guessing. So we want to focus the dynamic analysis. We're gonna be looking at any kind of file system, registry modifications, uh, network traffic generation. We're gonna be running auto runs to see if uh, you know it's gonna be auto starting on reboot, any kind of new kill to processes. And the two tools that we're gonna be using um, during the bulk of our dynamic analysis is auto runs and process monitor, which are both out of the Microsoft Sys Internals toolkit.
예수를 So basic dynamic analysis, something has to change, right? Have you guys ever clicked on malware and it does nothing? Probably not, right? It has to establish persistence somehow. It has to modify the file system. It has to uh, modify registry keys. So as we can see here, these are some of the registry keys um, that are commonly modified. My, my software, Microsoft Windows current version, run, run once, run services, and run services once. Um, if you ever see those are being modified as a telltale sign that there is some badness going on. There's, the malware also has to um, be persistent across reboot. Uh, it will create rogue processes, and it will generate, generate network traffic, as we will see uh, in a couple slides. I can take that back if you want. Shh. There we go. Okay. Auto runs for persistent detection. So that is uh, my boy Mark Rusinovich down there. Really cool dude. Now uh, leads the Azure team over at Microsoft. So what does this program do? Auto runs. It uh, it looks for programs and processes that are going to start automatically on re reboot. A really cool feature is that you can hide the signed Microsoft entries. And what this is going to do is any kind of uh, third party software that has uh, modified the registry to start um, automatically across reboot. Those are going to bubble up to the surface. So any kind of badness is going to come up right up to the surface. And you're not going to see all the valid uh, Microsoft entries in there. So the compare feature and the color codes are worth their weight in gold. Um, I really like the colors. So uh, the compare feature is um, what you're going to do. You're going to basically um, take a snapshot within auto runs. Then you're going to blow up your malware. Then you're going to take a second snapshot, and it's basically going to tell you what was added. And it's going to be right there, and it'll be very easy to see. So Procmon for behavioral monitoring. These are all the activities going on in the um, file system registry, network, processes, boot time logging, and proc trees. So James did already cover um, these APIs. The underlying ones are really the dangerous ones that you want to look, look out for during your dynamic analysis. So these file operations, um, these APIs write file, which is going to be writing a file to the file system. Um, set disposition information file, which is a really long way of saying delete file. I'm not sure why Microsoft did that. It's, it's Microsoft. But registry operations, um, some dangerous APIs that you can look for, reg set value that he covered, reg delete key, and reg delete value, and then process operations, proc create. Procmon continued. Okay, so the filtering feature is really cool in Procmon. So we're going to be, uh, it'll record processes, create creation, killing across reboot. Um, it is kind of like a, like a Lamborghini going 200 miles an hour and you open the hood. Um, and there's going to be a lot going on in there. So you really have to use your filtering. So those dangerous APIs that I was talking about, like um, reg set value, set disposition, information file, you can filter for all that stuff uh, right here. So we're going to filter on the operation. We would drop our malware in there. Um, and then you're going to be specifically looking for those APIs. So as opposed to, you know, 200,000 or 300,000 events, now you have 40 events. And Proc Procmon is very... Um, very usable. RedShot is another really cool tool. Um, a lot of these tools have a lot of the same functionality. Um, it's kind of just shooter's choice. So what RedShot is going to do is look at file system and registry modifications also. You're going to take a snapshot of your clean system. You're going to detonate, detonate your malware. You're going to take a second snapshot, and then you're going to compare the two. Um, I don't like the defaults in RedShot because it does not scan the directories by default. You have to manually uh, check scan DIRs, and it, by default, it'll scan um, the root drive and then the Windows folder. You want to scan just the root drive so it hits everything. So for example, here on the left-hand side, um, this is uh, some of the output that it'll do, just a plain TXT file. I was using Flare VM for blowing this malware up, and it looks like uh, a folder was added, 12648430, and we'll, we'll probably be seeing that number again later. Um, then it was deleted real quickly, uh, budgetreport.exe was deleted. So. Oh yeah, I think you're just too far away from the computer. <laughs> okay. 
So fake net is really cool stuff. Um, as James mentioned before, you're gonna be doing your malware analysis in host only mode. So you're not gonna have your internet access. You can only communicate with the host. So fake net for the win. You're gonna basically gonna run fake net with admin privs in your sandbox for malware analysis. And it's gonna simulate like you have a live internet connection. It's gonna stand up an HTTP server, uh, DNS, uh, SMTP. Um, and then HTTPS also. So, and as we can see here, this is some uh, malware that Tom Somerville created. Uh, it's called sassypants.exe, and I blew this up in my Flare VM uh, host-only sandbox. And uh, so I clicked on Sassy Pants, and what happens here? As we can see here, it, there's some DNS calls. Uh, Gurkhan dot thomas somerville dot com well that's obviously malicious right he's just a bad person so the our, our dns listener also received a, a dns a record request for dev server dot thomas thomas somerville dot com well what happened next <laughs> i got stallone sorry tom i changed it uh, yeah, that's about it. That's the talk, I think. Um, so there's more tools of the trade. We can talk all day about tools. Again, uh, you know, I said earlier that tools, when it comes to analysis, are like you're battling the bad guys. When one doesn't work, you just pick up the next one, you keep going.